But in a moment of time, we're about to go into something that I consider very fundamental. It's in the very heart of the apostolic perspective as revealed in scripture. It's a very platform and basis upon which progress can be made in our work with God. Amen. The focus for this month is Jesus, the man Jesus. Whereas the Muslims claim that they acknowledge the rise of Jesus and by classification they have labeled him a prophet. Amen. That's not the Jesus of the Bible. The one they are talking about is another person entirely. That's why we need to know who the real Jesus is. The great messengers acknowledge Jesus as one of the enlightened masters that came in his own season and era to bring the illumination about the universal God. That one they speak about is not the Jesus of the Bible. It might be a type or a shadow, but not the reality. Of the personality and the person of Jesus. And the Lord spoke to me and said that our emphasis this month is to discover the real Jesus. Now the purpose, the purpose and the reason why the devil sows the seed of falsehood in the body of Christ is so that a day will come where people will accept another gospel. Where people will receive a different spirit. Where people will acknowledge another Jesus. Are you with me? In that day, the church will bow down to a God that men like Apostle Paul do not know. And there has been this battle in the body of Christ to take away the original and live with us the duplicates. And that's why on the island of Patmos, Jesus had to appear himself to introduce himself to an apostle of that time. John was an icon. He was a custodian of the revelations of God. In fact, he was the only surviving apostle that did not die, die the death of martyrdom. He was spared for a final revelation that will be encapsulated in the document that will circulate among the people of God as the testimony of God. When Jesus appeared to John on the Isle of Patmos, Jesus had to introduce himself afresh to John. And if there was anybody that knew Jesus at all, it was John. But when, G when John saw Jesus on the Isle of Patmos, he said, I saw one that was like unto the Son of Mine. It was a similar he used. He was not so sure if it was Jesus. But he, at least he could say it was like Jesus. It's needful for us to understand the real Jesus. Because many religions portray him in a type. Try to put him in a context and in a crucible. So that he will be seen in a certain light. Even preachers today make him look like a money doubler and a man that gives false hope. So we need to go back to the scriptures to find out who is Jesus. And from the, from, from the pages of the scripture, as we, we get guidance from the scripture, then we can understand the revelation of Jesus. First of all, we need to know who Jesus is. Then we'll get to know about the fact that the revelation of Jesus is a core factor in your work with God. If you are devoid of consistent and subsequent revelations of Jesus, your Christian life is going to stagnate. Hallelujah. So we are going to take an anthem. We are going very far and our lectures this evening and this weekend is going to be very deep. We are trying to hit at the very heart of the Christian faith to understand why believers in our time are no longer growing in leaps and bounds. Jesus only discipled the apostles for three and a half years and the fullness of his essence was captured. They rattled the foundation of cities. They contended with thrones in the territories. The devil was not, could not use the machinery in the earth to crush them. The more they killed them, if you kill one, the anointing falls upon another one. 
If you kill one, the more terrible one rises up. Why could they not stop this Jesus? There's something about him we need to know. And the knowledge of Jesus is going to administer some form of deliverance to us. At least, discernment will be ministered to us to know what Jesus is not. And how your Christian life is going to advance thereafter. Matthew chapter number 16. Now I'd like us to appreciate the burden that was upon Jesus when he was trying to minister and to bear testimony of heavenly things. The burden that was upon Jesus was that in bearing te- testimony of heavenly things, he had a constraint. The constraint that Jesus had was the people he was testifying to or testifying heavenly things to had no idea how heaven, the heaven operates. Now, if you have never been to Port Harcourt, and I'm trying to explain, tell you how Port Harcourt is. Rumokoro, I'm trying to tell you that there's a place called Rumokoro in Port Harcourt. If you have never been there, it will be great. It will be very difficult for me because I don't know what you know that I can use as an example. If you have never been to my village before, and I'm trying to tell you the place where the borehole is, my God, you can't imagine it because you have never been there. And Jesus had a great challenge communicating the things that he had to share with humanity because he was coming from a realm that no man had ever been. Because of that, there, he had to be a peculiar kind of teacher. Hallelujah. He had to be an object teacher to be able to explain and to bring us into the understanding of the things that he was trying to communicate. For instance, if Jesus wants to talk about... Um, Jesus wanted to talk about eternal life. He wanted to talk about the salvation experience and how that in the salvation experience, the Holy Spirit tabernacles your depths just like water can be found in a well. And then you reach out. You need to reach deep before you can find the water. He was trying to dig a well in a woman. All right? In order for him to do that, first of all, he had to sit on a well first. Because he was trying to make the environment illustrate that which he wanted to do. If you have given your life to Christ, the Bible says, By this we know that we dwell in him and him in us, for he has given us of his spirit. Now, if you want to take your bath, for instance, and you are using a pail, and you take water out of the bucket and use it to refresh in your body. By this we know that the pail is in the bucket of water. Just in case the pail has some perforation under it. And you place it on the bucket or in the bucket of water. You find out that some of the water will flow into the pail. Alright? So the Bible says this is the proof that we dwell in God. We were taken and brought into God. The proof is that some of God has come into us. A measure of God tabernacles in us. That was what Jesus was trying to illustrate to the woman at the well. That the salvation experience is like this well. So first of all, Jesus began from the natural. Asking her to give him water. Alright, it looked natural. And the woman said, well, I can't give you water because you are a Jew. My tribe doesn't fellowship with your tribe. We don't believe in your tribe. Jesus now went further. And said, if you know the gift of God and him who is speaking to you, you would have asked me and have, or I would have given you li- living water. The woman said, my God. Because Jesus has gone a little bit beyond the plane of the natural. And now the woman is confused. And the woman is saying, well, you don't have anything to draw water with. With what? Or by what? Or how can you afford the water you are speaking about that you have capacity to give? So the woman was still in the natural. But you see, the environment was communicating what Jesus was teaching. The world that Jesus was sitting on was enough message that would retain the woman's consciousness to the environment of the emphasis of God. Are you still with me? Oh my God. I say, are you here? Jesus.
When Jesus said to the woman that he had water to give to the woman that she does not know of. The woman changed the salutation. Before the woman called Jesus a Jew. When Jesus said, I have something to give you that you don't know of. If only you knew the gift of God. Hey. She changed her perspective and called Jesus a sir. Sir. You don't have what to draw with. Where will you get this living water that you speak about? Hallelujah. So you see, there's some depth has been established from Jew to what? Sir. Ah. <laughs> Jesus now said, He that drinketh of this word is a test again. But the water that I do give, it shall be a well of water. A well of water. So he had to see it on the well because he was trying to do something. Trying to make the woman come into something that the well could, can illustrate. It will be in you a well of water springing up to eternal life. Then Jesus said, where is your husband? He said, well, I have no husband. Say you didn't lie this time. You used to lie before in the street. Lie in your compound. But today you decided not to lie. The truth is you have had five husbands. And the man you are with now is not your husband. No bright prize. You just moved in. <laughs> then the man said, I perceive you are a prophet. You must be. You see, there has been movement. From what? Jew. To what? Sir. To what? Prophet. That's advancement. The woman did not know that Jesus was constructing something inside of her. You see, she had no idea that this well, the environment was speaking what Jesus wanted to achieve. Well, the woman asked, What if I digress? Our fathers used to worship God on this mountain, but you guys say that uh, it's in Jerusalem that we must worship. Jesus said, the time has come. Now is that time where people will no longer worship on this mountain, neither will they worship in Jerusalem. But the time has come and now is where the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Hey! The woman said, this is too much for me. You cannot understand this. Your theology has become, your philosophy is too deep for me to understand. Oh, when Messiah comes, at least we have a promise that there's one coming. When that one comes, he will teach us all this thing. And Jesus said, him that is speaking to you now, I am he. Now, from where? Sir. To what? Jew first. To what? To what? Now we are talking Messiah. You see, until she got to that level, the water Jesus promised to give, because at the end of the day, Jesus did not receive any water from the woman. So she now realized that it was all about her, not all about Jesus. It was a strategy of the Spirit to bring her into something that she had no idea about, and this teacher use the environment to convince her to bring her into something in God that a well was illustrated. Did you get it? Are you with me now? Now, so do you see the challenge Jesus had when he had to teach us of things that we are not acquainted with? Because of the challenge upon him, he had to become an object teacher. He will bring you into the environment of what he wants to say. Before he begins to say it. So that the environment will speak it. And when the environment speaks it. Your understanding. Your assimilation will be enhanced. I want you to have that at the back of your mind. As we journey today. In the name of Jesus Christ. Matthew 16. In Matthew chapter 16. Jesus took the entire apostolic band on a cross country. They moved from one end of Israel to another end of Israel. 
Before Jesus opened his mouth to consider the things that was upon his heart, he had to travel with the entire gang. Move from one end to another end. I was wondering why Jesus had to take all the pain to travel like that. But he's an object teacher. He cannot communicate these heavenly things until there is something in the earth that sustains the same principle with the emphasis he wants to bring. If not, he will be talking into the air and the possibility of understanding was not present. And so he took them from one end of the nation, took them to the other end of the nation just because he wanted to bring about an emphasis. In Matthew chapter 16, we'll begin our reading from verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist. Some Elias and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bajona. For flesh and blood had not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus had to travel from one end of Israel to the other end. In order for him to make a statement. The emphasis that was in his spirit at that point in time was to begin to disclose the revelation of the church. The revelation of God's spiritual building. Just like men build natural buildings, God is trying to say that I'm embarking upon a project. But I'm embarking upon a spiritual project. Alright? Now, Jesus had to take them all the way from one end of Israel to another end of Israel brought them into the region of Caesarea Philippi. And why did he do that? Because at this point in time in Philippi, in Caesarea, the, the governor, whose name was Philip, was undergoing some construction work in the city. He painted the city of Caesarea knocked down some old buildings, replaced them with new ones. So the city had a facelift. If you have not been to that city in the past six months and you came into the territory, as at the time that Jesus brought the apostles in this epistle, you will notice that the place has taken a new look. When you come into the territory, you will see things that have to do with building. You see cement banks, Iron rods, gravel, everywhere. You see paint patches, everywhere. And so everything in the environment was speaking construction. Alright? Everything in the environment, when you just see the environment, is speaking construction. When there's construction everywhere. In fact, it was because of the excellence of the construction, the blending of the paintings, that the name Philippi was added to Caesarea. In honor of Philip the Tetrarch, that was the governor of the province. And the reason why Jesus took them all the way to that point was because he wanted to disclose a great secret. And the secret he wanted to disclose was that he was also constructing. Just like Philip was constructing the city of Philippi, he was also involved in a construction project. But it happens to be that his construction project is not an earthly project. It's a spiritual project. But you see, you can now understand his project when the environment is speaking construction. Did you get it to that point? Now, and um, somehow, Jesus, who prior to this time was not concerned about what men, what people said about him, suddenly became 
concern. And then was throwing out questions and, and questionnaires in town. Who do men say that I am? It may surprise you to know that Jesus wants to know what a generation says about him. It may surprise you to know that Jesus wants to know what the church says about him. And so he said, who do men say that I am? And there were a catalog of answers. I realized that Jesus did not say correct or wrong. Well, he decided eventually to narrow down the scope of the research. He said, who do you say that I am? Now, we are trying, the focus of our emphasis is discovering the real Jesus. And that's why those questions went out. Who do you say that Jesus is? What is your testimony of Jesus? Now, become as we advance. Amen? Who do you say that I am? And spontaneously, Peter seized the moment. And he brought his historic confession. He said, thou art the Christ. Thou art the son of the living God. Notice again that Jesus did not say correct. Did he, did he say so? Correct. This is the answer I've been looking for. Jesus began to explain the mechanism behind the response of Peter. He didn't say whether Peter was correct. He said that confession was based upon the revelation from the Father. Hmm. That is to say that there is no possibility of knowing Jesus outside of revelation. In fact, the disciples that were with Jesus for three and a half years, I know that you, you would want to be one of them. Maybe for 20 days, you will switch positions with Peter. So that you have the privilege to put your pillow close to the head of Jesus, at least for 20 days. What a great wonder. But you see, it happens to be that the context of the scripture was a season where God had put it in the heart of Jesus to begin to reveal things about the church. That everything Jesus was doing was to the end that a church will be formed. A church will be founded. Okay? And just in case you stayed with Jesus in the same room, you were not yet one with Jesus. Except you had a revelation from God. In order for you to be part of his church, you must have a revelation from his father about him. It is that revelation that has the capacity to make you one with him. So the true identity of Jesus cannot be designed by you walking with him on the streets. Paul said, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. He said there was a certain time that we knew Jesus after the flesh. Indicative of the fact that Paul knew Jesus in the days of his flesh. Paul knew him. He said that we knew Jesus before. After the flesh. But our knowledge of him in the flesh <laughs> by no means was a benefit to us. And so the response that Jesus was expecting when he passed out the question, who do you say that I am? Was not a response that was gathered from historical perspective. Was not a response that was derived from a theological perspective. Not the response of what you can read from the Bible as it were. But a response that had come to you by revelation. Because Jesus was an eternal personality. And except you have a revelation of him, you don't know him. You might read your scripture, read your Bible, know everything the Bible says about Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Doesn't mean you know him. Because the Bible says there's only one that knows him. It's only the father that knows him. It's unfortunate. That it is the father himself that will disclose his son. It's the father himself that will disclose what he knows about his son. And it happens to be that revelation about Jesus, the revelation of Jesus is critical to your spiritual advancement when walking on the path of spiritual progress. 
Now, many Christians ask me as we go around the nation teaching the Bible from place to place. They ask me, can you really explain why my Christian life stagnated? Many say they were doing well in the law. And then suddenly they just discovered that there was a stagnation. You must understand the operating system that drives a Christian life. Jesus said, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. This disclosure came to you from my father because there's only one that knows me. And if you are speaking these things now, that, that is accurate about me, then it means that you have heard some whispers from my father. The real Jesus can only be known by revelation. And if you don't have a revelation of him, you don't know him. And I will show you the difference between people that have revelation of Jesus and people that just know Jesus in the Bible. People that understand Jesus from the historic perspective. You will come to discover that on the strength of the revelation that came from the Father, that Peter downloaded the historic confession. Jesus said that upon this rock are built my structure just as philip is constructing the foundation of the structure that i'm going to be putting up is this rock now wait calm down it's a long journey so i don't want you to miss the <laughs> the introduction now if jesus said upon this rock this i hope you know anything called this is tangible if Peter had received the revelation and had kept mute, Jesus would not have been able to say upon. Ah, are you still in the lecture? <laughs> I said, are you here today? Jesus wouldn't have been able to say upon this rock because by saying this rock, he was referring to something that was known, something that was expressed, something that was almost visible. Do you get it? Jesus. Oh my God. Did you get that? Okay. He said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. It has always been said in the body of Christ that the rock Jesus was talking about was the revelation of Jesus, revelation of Christ, which is true. But I found that something in addition to that in my studies. You know, revelation is personal. The reason why revelation is personal because it is born in the core of your human spirit. It is facilitated by the presence of the Holy Spirit in your spirit. The Bible says we have received the spirit which is not of this world, but a spirit which is of God, that we may know the things that are freely given to us of God. And it's needful for you to understand that the word know there is not mental knowledge. It's not the kind of knowledge you acquire in the library, but it's a knowledge that is revealed. It's a different word, it's a pygnosis. They revealed knowledge. So the spirit of God has come so that it can facilitate the revealed knowledge of Christ. Did you get it to that point? Are you with me? Now, so it is because it's the spirit of God that is in you that brings about the revelation of things that pertain to God. That's why revelation is personal. And that's why revelation is inward. Many things can be said from the pulpit, but the Holy Spirit in your spirit moves into action and crystallizes a personal revelation that the person sitting close to you did not receive. That is a spiritual action that took place by the very Holy Ghost that indwells your spirit. He was the one that caused such enlightenment to come to you. And he came to you in the privacy of your spirit. If the revelation Peter received remained in the privacy of his spirit, Jesus would not have said this wrong. Because when he gave voice to that revelation, it became something tangible that everybody under the sound of his voice could hear. So Jesus could refer to it as what? This. 
So let me paraphrase that. The church is founded upon a confession. The, a confession of the revelation of Jesus. We have a long way to go. These are just tools for our journey. The church is, is what? Now just in case you came with a, a script. You came with a writing part. I would advise you to write. That the church is founded upon a confession which is based on the revelation of a person. Founded upon a confession which is based upon the revelation of a person. That was why Jesus could say, this rock. So we call Peter's response the historic confession. A confession that is established upon, based upon the revelation of a person. Now after Jesus said that the foundation of my spiritual building is going to be confessions based on revelations about me. Jesus went further to say, the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against this kind of foundation. Mm. That's the difference between the person that has the historical knowledge or the Bible knowledge of Jesus and the person that received a revelation of Jesus. When the gates of hell come to test, because everything you claim you have received will come under test. In fact, we only have capacity to believe what you say you have received when it has passed the test that such kinds of revelation attract. The Bible reveals to us in the in the book of Matthew chapter 13 when the parable of the sower was on this course trying to give us understanding of those seeds that fell by the wayside those seeds that fell in stony places the Bible speaking about those seeds that came that grew up in stony places, the Bible said that they had no root in themselves. That means they had no hidden life. No life of revelation. Everything about them was outward. Most of what they did was a copy, copycat. There was no depth in them because there was no hidden life in them. Nothing was being born inside of their spirit. But they knew church language. They, can, they understand church cliche. They know how to sing church songs. And when they blend among the believers, you cannot discern them. And the Bible says it's only when the sun rises and scorches them that you know their what. Are you still with me? I say, are you here? When Jesus was giving an interpretation to the parable, he said that those guys that grew quickly, without root, they had no understanding. Of the message that they had. And they were rejoicing. Basking in the joy of the message. Not understanding the implication of the message. Not understanding that you have to pay a price on the account of the message. Then the Bible now said. That on the account of that word that came to them. Persecution came. Trouble came. The guests of hell came. So we might be in a conference like this. And the word of God is going forth. People, the average Christian don't understand that whether you receive the word of God, whether you understood it or not, if the issues of emphasis are core issues that border on the economy of God, the devil will come to steal it from you. The gates of hell will show up quickly so that the possibility of the germination of that seed will not find expression. And so, if you did not take the word of God seriously. If you did not allow it to take root in your life. But you were rejoicing in the fact that there was such a promise. Rejoicing in the, in the, in the possibilities of that world. And then suddenly the gates of hell now came to check what you did with it. And then now found out that you have no root, no hidden life, no revelation. That the things you were confessing was not, did not have their roots in your spirit. They had their roots on your lips and on your soul. Where you joyed about it and you spoke about his splendor. But it doesn't have its roots in your spirit. The Bible says that kind of believer 
When they came under the influence of the scourging sun, they withered. Why? Because when the gates of hell comes to try you, you don't contend it, contend against it with mental assent. You don't say, I know Jesus of the Bible. He raised the dead. That's not enough to contend with the gates of hell. The gates of hell comes with power, comes with force. Only that which has taken root in your spirit can rise up to challenge it. So the Jesus of the Bible can only be known, the real Jesus can only be known by revelation. So many people might regard him as a prophet in their books. That's not him. Any knowledge of him that you can acquire naturally is not an accurate knowledge that can contend with the gates of hell. And so some religions might have a type that might call, make it, say, this name is referring to this person. <laughs> you can consume that for 30 days, but you have not met the real Jesus. It was the day that Peter received this revelation from heaven that he became clear that they didn't know Jesus all the while. Because in that revelation was a dual dimension of his reality. The dual dimension of his reality. Knowing him as the Christ is understanding the office that you are praised from. Understanding his ministry. Hallelujah. And knowing him as the son of God is understanding his person. From eternity to eternity, from everlasting to everlasting, he is the son of God. And you see, in this study we need to branch out. And then we need to discuss the two dimensions of the revelation that Peter received from heaven. And how it is ordained by God to be the key that unlocks the chambers of the spirit that advances your the, the part of spiritual progress in your life. Without a consistent revelation of Jesus, your Christian life is going to stagnate. The reason why we have so many textures, so many shades and colors of the Christian faith today is because in an increasing measure, the reality of Christ is diminishing so fast from the body of Christ. And what we have is an assortment of activities ranging from the spurious to the scandalous. And that substance is missing. If you are here, say amen. amen. Now, you see, it's a long journey. That's why I'm trying to lay the foundation. And on the strength of this, I need you to understand that every layer we, we, we advance to, every level we get to in this lecture, please keep asking yourself the question, who can I say that Jesus is? Now we speak his name. His name is found in songs. We have his name in melody. Every time Jesus. Ah. <laughs> Malasate. But you'll find out that the average believer has no revelation of him. And that's why as time goes on, Christianity becomes weaker. Because that historic confession is no longer on the lips of the saints. Thou art. That's something coming from heaven. Thou art. That's the one you got inside of you. Thou art. That did not come from the pulpit. It came because something precipitated on your inside. And life came out. And an understanding was gained. That's the only kind of knowledge that can make you advance. Just in case your Christian life is beggarly, weak, crying for help. It's because there is no thou art. No confession that is coming out of your mouth that is based upon the revelation of a person. If you are still here, say amen. amen. Thou art. When last did you say that? As we study the life of the man Peter, the very one that somehow was able to hear the whispers of eternity. I don't know how, but that's where he got it from. If you check his story, you might say, well, I'm better than Peter. At least I've not fallen. Peter fell. What I want to draw your attention to is something critical. Not everybody that fell was able to rise. When Judas fell, he fell and fell along. He fell headlong. And there was no strength to raise him up. The Bible says even the young men shall faint. And what? The young men shall utterly fall. The youth shall faint and be weary. And the young men shall what? Utterly fall. That's the fall of Judas. They cannot fall that no redemption can save you. 
Anybody that does not have a revelation of Jesus will be banking upon the insufficiencies of his humanity. And when you fall that way, when you fall and your only treasury is the insufficiencies of your humanity, and it happens to be that you cannot fight something that is orchestrated from the realm of the spirit with the beggarly implements of your humanity. He said the youth shall faint and be weary. Because the young man's glory is his strength. And many times when he comes and shakes himself, Samson thought it was the shaking that made God shift his throne. That any time he shook, the throne of God will shake. He factored it into something natural. Until he did not know what to guard jealously. He did not know what to fight for. He did not know when to take his journey. He felt any time he shakes, the throne of God will shake and God will step into action. Unfortunately, there was a day he shook. And that day he shook so well. And he shook as other times. That means he did not miss it in the shaking. The shaking was in the same configuration. The shaking was in the same pattern. That's why the apostles came to Jesus and said, Why could we not cast him out? Because the same thing Jesus said was what they said. In the saying, they were accurate. In the conduct, they were good. In the waving of their hands, they were perfect. They looked on top of the situation. They came with boldness. And they did not say anything that Jesus did not say. But there was no effect. So they can to call Jesus. See, there's something you have not taught us. Why could we not cast him out? Because when the gates of hell come to contend against you, it's not head knowledge. It's not copycat that will see you through. It is something that came by revelation. So there's little revelation in the body of Christ. Recycling of, of sermons. We cannot break into new pedestals in God's glory. And it happens to be that God is so deep. And the revelations of God are as deep as God. The power of God is as deep as God. The gifts of the spirit are as deep as God. But we keep operating in the periphery and the, in, in the shallow places. And basking and saying hallelujah. Oh my God. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of where I am. I desperately need the push. And I found out that the push that is possible can only come by revelation. You might say you are better than Peter. You have kept yourself, you did not fall. At no point did you deny Jesus. Before you press hard, too hard, let me bring you wisdom. Hallelujah. Peter. We saw the scenario. Jesus came and said, Peter, huh, the devil intends to sift you like wheat. So I prayed for you anyway. That your faith will not fail. And then Jesus said, and when thou are restored, strengthen your brother. You know why Peter could be restored? Not because of prayers that were made for him but because he knew see there's a knowledge that comes to you by revelation that knowledge is as much a part of you as your own beating heart there is nothing that can happen that the hearts of darkness can take that knowledge away from you is part of you even if you backslide and you go back to the beer parlor and you take it you take sazen brow the taste will be different from the other person the reason is because there is a knowledge inside that keeps haunting you. It doesn't allow you liberty to enjoy that way because what? He knew. That's what makes the gate of hell not to ever have a final say because of what? He knew. It's a knowledge that he picked up and this knowledge he picked up, he did not pick it up from the library. This knowledge he picked up, it was not communicated to him by a professor. He didn't hear it by the hearing of the ear. It came by the revelation of the father. And it was as much a part of him as his own beating heart. You, if you want to take that knowledge and kill him, it had fused into his system. It was part of his spirit. It had, it had given texture, color, tone, tint, and volume to his spirit. He knew. He knew. And Judas, who told you that they didn't pray for him? But he didn't know. <laughs> there was no revelation. So his recovery did not have an anchor. Please keep, help me ask your neighbor quickly, quickly. Who do you say Jesus is? Many 
call him a money doubler, someone that gives false hope. He said, This week miracles will come and nothing happens. It's not Jesus that spoke, it's a fraud star that spoke because every time Jesus spoke, it happened. So we need to find out who is the real Jesus. We see people say Jesus as 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 a name that punctuates a sermon. We preach and preach and preach and say it's gonna be so in the name of Jesus. It doesn't happen. Where, where is Jesus? Let's let's find out. Mm, let's find out. The real Jesus can only be discovered by what? By revelation. Because it's only the Father that knows him. And as I study my Bible, when last did you study the book of Acts of the Apostles? I found out why those guys did the things that they did. There was a consistent ongoing revelation of Jesus that never came to an end in their lives. For every revelation of Jesus you receive, there is a dimension of your destiny that becomes operational. You didn't hear that. Now I want you to write that. Ah, na, 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 na. It's a long journey today. Ma la 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 la. Sha na 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 ma na na na. If you don't know some things, you will not pray in a certain way. You avoid prayers that were intended to unlock several chambers of the spirit. I'm tired of being in the shallow places. I need a lift. I need. I need a lift. I need a lift. I said every revelation of Jesus you receive makes a part of your destiny operational. And I said that with boldness because even today I went through all the scriptures in the New Testament that testified about scenarios where men encountered Jesus. Today I went through it. So that I can speak authoritatively. Just in case you decide to go upon your own Bible escapade in Bible study you will not find anything different from the things I'm telling you. Now, let me show you a scenario. Before I show you that scenario, I want to read the scripture to us. If you are still understanding me, say amen. amen. I can't hear you. Say amen. amen. Now, when we get to the offices, hallelujah, it is very easy for you to know who knows Jesus or not. Very easy. Because if your spirit has received something that has stabilized your soul, it will be revealed in your daily life. That conviction will express itself through your daily life. Where your confidence is, where your power is, where your soul rests on. The thing you trust in, the philosophy that your hopes are bound upon, will design your life and give you a particular outlook in your daily walk. And anybody that gets to stumble into your corridor, we know where your stronghold is. I was through with my youth service. And all through my youth service time, I prayed so much for God to give me direction for what to do next. And God did not speak to me about me. He spoke to me about the mission field. It was on the 20th day of October, 2002. The Lord opened my eyes and showed me, told me that the place of your primary assignment in ministry is Benway State. By that which I walk through your life, many young people will be raised to see me as I am. That was where he spoke to me and said, raise a remnant for me in this generation. And he gave me eight characteristics that typify the remnant. That's when I discovered that the remnant factor it's not a quantitative factor, it's a qualitative factor. Those were the things he, went, he, he kept bombarding me with when I was in youth service. I prayed so much to know what next. God didn't tell me about what next until my 12 months were accomplished. And after my 12 months, I declared 21 days of fasting that I will not taste of food, nor drink, until the Lord has come to show me where to put my steps who told you you are so wise that you can just slip your head around and choose a wife alas kill and eat mm. hallelujah 
<laughs> Hallelujah. 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 strong my friend God did not factor into humanity the function of direction it's not factored into humanity not factored into your humanity your brain might be dazzling you, you may have earned yourself a first class degree in your discipline but it doesn't lend you the powers of direction to know where to set your feet if you ever get that function and if you ever get it right it must be by the revelation of Jesus. I bound myself with the fast for 21 days. Not to eat nor drink until I had the Lord's word about the next step of my life. Something unusual happened. Normally I get to fast like I don't like fasting for three days because experience has taught me that if I fast long range, short range fast, fast I get nothing. I go for 20 days. I go for 45 days. That's the way I do it. Hallelujah. So when I heard somebody say, sorry, let me not discourage you because you are not like me. Some people say they went for three days dry fasting and God spoke to when I do that, he doesn't speak to me. So I know that I'm meant for the long range. So I set my heart to go and go and go. But God broke the protocol that day. He spoke to me the first day of my fast. He said, arise. Go to Kano. And wait for me there. Hey. Then there was a riot in Kano. Everybody was running away from Kano. But he said, arise, go to Kano. I knew nobody would allow me to go there because I just lost my dad that time. And my mom was just learning the ropes on the paths of widowhood. And I happened to be her last son. And she was now the authority of the house. And with the kind of emotion she has, she would not allow the son to go to Kano because she was seen dead in that mission. But I went up to her and I said, the Lord said I'll have to go back to Kano. As usual, my expectations were, were manifested in a response. And I said, well, if God spoke to me, he will convince you. And I went about my business. A few days later, she could not sleep again. No sleep in the night. I said, all right, go so that I can sleep. I said, you have so much sleep now. <laughs> and I moved. Went back. And I kept praying for months. After many months. That was when. When he said go and wait for me. It was actually two years and four months. You know he takes his time. He gets himself set. And just in case you become tired. And you leave your duty post. The place he says you wait. You have mortgaged 15 years of your life. It's better to wait for two years, four months, than to take off like a tornado, pretending that you have the function of direction factored into your humanity. Your way will be the way of the wilderness. And if you, if, if at all your bones are found, eh? If your bone, if they see your carcass, your remains, because the possibility of finding it doesn't exist. 
When you see the valley of dry bones, it's littered with the bones of men that were not ready to wait for God. People that took off before he showed up. He told them to wait. But before he came, they took, took off like a tornado. So it's difficult to find their bones. Whose bones are these? Just in case. Yours are found. They will be very dry. <laughs> he said, wait for me. And it took two years, four months. For you to get a tool from God that can stand the gate of hell. Friends, if it costs you waiting, wait. Because any man without the revelation of Jesus is like a student without a badge. Those days in Mount St. Gabriel's, all right? You, de- you, can, you can walk barefooted, but don't go without a badge. <laughs> you know, an all boys school, eh? <laughs> the Lord give you understanding. <laughs> If you don't have any badge, you have no identity. You can either pretend the government college student or Mass and Gabriel student because our uniform was the same. The only difference was what? Badge. Ask your neighbor, who do you say he is? Do you have a badge? Okay, jump with me. Let me show one scripture. Then we'll see the scenarios. Don't forget what I said in the exposition that came to the revelation that Peter received. The dual dimensions of the revelation of Christ was revealed. Thou art the Christ, revealing his office and his ministry. Thou art the Son of the living God, revealing his person. We are going to see Jesus as the Son of God. Then we'll see Jesus as the Christ. Now, so for tonight, we'll just... The time will only afford us the opportunity to see Jesus as the Son of God. When you read in your Bible, you shall conceive and you shall give birth to a son. And you hear Mary say, How shall this things be seen that I know, no, know not a man? And the angel coming to say that the power of God shall come upon you. The spirit of the highest will overshadow you. And that holy thing that shall be conceived of you shall be called the son of God. <laughs> That's a powerful statement I tell you. So we need to look at Jesus as the son of God. There are several things that God needs you to see. In Jesus, the Son of God. Many more things that he needs you to see in Jesus, the Christ. Many more things he need to, needs you to see in Jesus, the Lord. If you don't have these three basic revelations, you cannot have your own personal revelation of him. Who do you say that the Son of Man is? And you can speak in tongues and do church stuff for so long and not know who the son of man is. And that's why your life will be stagnated. And when the gates of hell come to contend against you, you don't have enough resources to stand. Come with me. Second Peter chapter 1. Because we need to first of all begin to settle on the revelations of Jesus in the Gospels first. From that point we can now move in, into the revelation of Jesus in the epistles. Then, when we go to the book of Revelation, we see some very hypo revelations and disclosures. Some of which never feature in any other book of the Bible. Because God is trying to make us understand that as time goes on, the revelations of Jesus, the revelations of his son, that he makes available to the body of Christ, 
becomes more intense more intense because the era of the intensification has come god is about to round up his agenda upon the face of the earth and because of that he wants to bring more intense revelations of his son second peter in second peter chapter one I want us to read verse 3 together. One to go. According as his divine power had given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. Now I don't know when you read your Bible, do you believe it? You believe the things that you see in your Bible when you read it? The Bible says by an act of God's authority. It was his prerogative. It was his decision. To make available to us all things. That pertain to the realm of life. And pertain to our walk in godliness. First of all we need to ask ourselves what is godliness? What does he mean when he says. He makes available everything that pertains to life. And to godliness. What kind of life is he talking about? All the resources that are intended for you to be able to naturally live the life of Christ, the quality, nature, and character of life that Christ lived. All the resources to make it possible, He said He has given unto us all such. Secondly, godliness talks about manifesting God, the God life, and the God character, the God dimension to men. That's godliness. When God is revealed, expressed, and manifested. God revealed, expressed, manifested. There's, there's a dimension of God that can be revealed through your character. There's a dimension of God that can be revealed through your utterances, your words. There's a dimension of God that's not in word, but can only be demonstrated by acts of power. And that's why the Bible says that the kingdom of God is not what? Wherever the kingdom of God is present, there will be manifestations that will displace other kingdoms that hitherto covered that ground. That's what the, the Bible is saying in that context. And the Bible is saying that everything that makes for you to operate in the machinery of the quality of life and existence that Jesus sustained upon the face of the earth has been made available. And also the ingredients that will work and intermeddle with all the resources of heaven to ensure that there's a display of such before men he also makes it available all that pertain to life and to godliness the life he speaks of is not your natural life the life he speaks of is the manifestation the living on the living out of the divine life of which we have a deposit in christ jesus so that as in your natural life you know when it's time for you to go sleep because you feel weak your body is saying sleep and your natural life is what gave you that the education of the fact that your body needs sleep is your natural life that gave you the education of the fact that you are thirsty and you need some drink is your natural life that gave your body the education that is you, you are hungry and you need something to eat also your spiritual life begins to give you some kind of education and he said that god has placed all the resources in place made them available so that you can receive the education that the spiritual life gives in order for you to be able to respond to it now just like if you pray every morning and then one day you wake up and you don't pray your spiritual life will not be comfortable you will feel sad as if something is missing that is the same kind of education that your natural life gives you you are now receiving it now on a different level the reason why you are receiving it on the spiritual plane is because it has been given to you by the authority of god all things that pertain to life and godliness every mechanism every accessory that will make you function in the divine life as naturally as you did function in the natural life he has made it available for you so that you can understand the education of the divine life and respond 
so much so that you display you manifest it before men and then men will get to understand that the quality of life and the dimension that you're operating from is far removed from the ordinary you are functioning from the supernatural but it happens to be that the nature and fashion of your manifestation is that you manifest the supernatural naturally that is what will make men wonder they are not stressing those days we, oh my god we were we have been around the body of christ for a long time and those days there were funny things that people did in the name of the lord just like when somebody was under the influence of the spirit of prophecy he said shh shh, shh. and see that's darkness in fact that's flesh the fact that your spiritual doesn't make you weird that's flesh in fact if i see somebody do that we shut him down hey because he has already ad advertised maybe the utterance is correct but that manifestation is fleshly when god comes upon you and he wants to use your vocal cord you don't feel that way so that one he did was a drama in the flesh had nothing to do with what happened because the resources for it to become natural as your natural life have already been made up and when supernatural things take place in your life because of the resources that god has made available it will come to you like natural do you get it you hear the voice of god what naturally you don't need to shake there was one sister those days in the fellowship if she wants to prophesy she begins to go like this then i came to her one and said hey we are tired of your shaking you 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 distract the meeting well she her utterance is most of the time is correct but where did the shaking come from they don't understand that you are supposed to live out the supernatural naturally he made the resources available for you to operate that way What was this <laughs> it, it was those days when we were not mature in God. We would think that person is spiritual. Say you are in the flesh. Sit down and talk. When she saw that I was on her case, she had to leave the fellowship. And after many years, when I met her again, she prophesied for the first time and she was standing. No shaking. <laughs> the resources are available for you to do it naturally but you see all of those things that God has given to us are based on a password your ability to access the things that God has made available for us for life and for godliness are based on a password it only functions according to what the knowledge of him the extent to which you can you, you, you can be dynamic in the corridors of the divine life. The extent to which you can be resourceful in manifesting and representing God in the earth is dependent on the scope of knowledge that you function in. And sorry, this knowledge I speak of is not necessarily Bible knowledge. This knowledge I'm talking about is revealed knowledge. Revealed. Now, I have a lot of stories to tell you in order to give you, add muscle to the emphasis that I bring to you today. Hallelujah. Revealed knowledge. For five years, anytime the presence of God becomes thick in the place, I feel something on my right hand. Well, I felt that the Holy Spirit wanted to make me feel good. That's why He gave me those sensations on my right hand. It was consistent. It took me five years. And one day in the fifth year of that experience of the glory of God, a preacher came and was ministering. And then he said, the, I started feeling that thing on my right hand. Then he said, the power of God has come. Now I can begin to minister. Instantly I understood what I was feeling. Now what I was feeling was synchronized with what I was feeling. We felt the same thing at the same time. And then he had understanding of what he felt. Why did he have understanding? Because God had revealed to him, the revelation of Jesus had come to him. And told him what exactly the sensation he was receiving was. So he was ahead of me in the Christian journey. He was manifesting and healing the sick. But five years ago, the anointing had become operational in my life because I had no knowledge. I could not operate that anointing. It was when he was doing that that I now knew what the anointing was for. The next time I hit the pulpit and the anointing came, I stopped preaching. I said, God is here. People didn't believe me. But when I began to decree the word of God, it began to happen. From that day, I stopped being a learner. I became a master. The difference between that which is dead and that which is alive is that one has received a revelation of Jesus Christ that has power enough to contend with the gates of hell. Where do you stand today? 
Jesus moves around the body of Christ and is asking a question who do you say that I am it happens to be that the knowledge of him must come to you firsthand there are no duplicates you cannot you cannot spin it in your printing machine and get it printed out in mass production you know it doesn't work that way revelation of Jesus must come to you personally and the extent to which you have received such revelation is the degree to which you can take advantage of the resources that God has already given us by his authority so much resources given but it operates only by the knowledge of him you will show yourself to me show yourself to me show yourself to me you will show yourself to me I know I know I know she will show yourself to me come with me in the Bible as we journey Paul on the way to Damascus he had received letters from the chief priest authorizing him to bring everyone that mentioned the name of Jesus Christ into jail and also he had capacity by the authority bestowed upon him even to put such to death it was a glory ride all the way from Jerusalem to Damascus he was like he was like the arm of of the temple an apostle of the way of the Jews and he was going to bring the obedience to the faith to men that are Jews scattered across the face of many nations. And his first point of call, Damascus. <laughs> oh, you will show yourself to me. Riding in the company of a few people who had the same mandate, but he was the chief of the voyage. And he was riding with so much passion. And suddenly, a light, a blinding light, comes from above. Now come with me, let's read it from the text. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9. Okay. In order for you to understand me very well, follow me. I said I was going to do something. I was going to fragment the revelation of Jesus into its various compartments. The revelation that Peter received. That we'll look at Jesus as the Son of God. Look at Jesus as the Christ. Jesus as the Lord. In fact, you need to ask God to open your eyes for you to begin to see Jesus in the Bible. Because the book of Luke chapter 24 from verse 44 and 45 said the entire scriptures are testimonies about him. So the Bible is a book of Christ. It's a book about Jesus. And just in case you study your Bible and what you see is sackcloth and ashes. What you see is the garment of praise inside of the spirit of heaviness. What you see is a coat that was tied on a tree waiting to be rolled. And in all your reading, you don't get to see Jesus. <laughs> you, are, you are in darkness. Because that book is a book of Jesus the Christ. It's a testimony about a king and his kingdom. And it comes to give us knowledge. And that knowledge is knowledge indeed. Knowledge that is the access key that operates the bounties of God's kingdom. And anyone that is devoid of such knowledge is operating under a fatal lack. That no level of approximation can deliver him from. It's either you have a revelation or you don't have a revelation. And just in case you still sustain church language, when the gates of hell come, the quality of what you are will be
be revealed. The time has come for us to step up higher. The clarion call from the palace of God and the tablets of, of, of God speak plainly. Somewhere towards the end of 2011, God began to reveal that I have made myself available. Anybody that seeks me will find me and will find me fast because there's so much grace. But you see, that opening that was made available in the body of Christ, to the body of Christ in the spirit realm, largely was not tapped into. I was thinking that the topography of the body of Christ was going to experience a shift on the account of the fact that God has said, I have made myself available. Let your life not continue in circles and cycles. It's just going on like that, in circles and cycles, rainy season, dry season, and nothing significant is taking place in your in attaining the fullness of the ordination of God concerning you. Every phase of your destiny will respond to a revelation of Jesus. There were people in the Bible that could not enter into higher levels of ministry until they had another revelation of Jesus. John on the Isle of Patmos, great apostle, he was a custodian of the revelatory powers of God. God had to preserve him because he was his friend. Kept him alive to bear the last testimony. It was when he got to the Isle of Patmos. He had an encounter with Jesus. It was after that encounter when he received the revelation of Jesus as the Alpha and the Omega. The first and the last. The beginning and the ending. That was when he was commissioned afresh. He said, right. He became God's stenographer to write the things that he had seen the things that were and the things that shall come to pass hereafter that was where the secret of prophetic writing was handed down to john to write a single writing that will bear witness to the past give insight into the present and also unravel the mysteries of the future john stepped into that dimension when he had another revelation of jesus as what the alpha and what omega who do you say that jesus is it's your revelation of him that is responsible for your level of him. As, as we share from the word of God, I need you to understand that something is happening which many people do not know. The realms of God are becoming accessible. The gates of heaven is opening. Many people do not know that. That that is what is happening right now as we are talking. The place where light dwells is becoming accessible. The economy of God runs on a rhythm, runs on an operating system. The operating system upon which the economy of God runs is revelation. And that's why when the efficient believers believed unto Jesus, Paul began to pray a prayer point of emphasis. That the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. That you may know the hope of your calling. That is revelation. You will never understand the eternal purpose of God until you have a revelation. Those were the things that came to Paul in the wilderness of Arabia when he gave his life to Christ, a murderer. He was lowered, taken to Arabia. And when he came back from Arabia, he began to speak high things of the Spirit. When he was valued and evaluated by the other apostles that were worthy of note, and they saw his substance, they knew it was unique. They knew that the revelations of Christ have gone into another dimension. Even Peter himself said, the things that Paul has taught, they were difficult to understand. Because Paul received another measure of the apostolic grace to bring the church into the fullness of her purpose. She met with Jesus and he said, even though he appeared to the twelve, he appeared to Cephas, he appeared to the rest, he also appeared to me. But he appeared to me when he was no longer the season. He didn't show up in my life when it was popular to be a follower of Jesus, he appeared to me when all the handbills were no longer relevant, where all the posters were not relevant, where all the banners were no longer relevant. That's when he came to me. He came to me and he came and commanded me to go to revelate to Jerusalem. Pie revelation. It was another measure that came to him. And the testimony of his life was that he labored more than them all. But he said it was not him that never. When such a man sit down and begins to cry. That I may know him. You must understand that he understood that the entrance into other deeper dimensions of God. Was time.
died to the knowledge of this man called Jesus. It's an eternal personality. Even eternity cannot exhaust his reality if he reveals himself continually for all eternity. He will not be exhausted. So that there will be no counterfeits. The New Testament thrives on the password of the revelation of Jesus. Come with me. I want to take two days to teach in this meeting. Today, tomorrow, on Sunday, I will call Jesus. He will come down. I will not be in a hurry. Because as he's moving in the crowd, I'll be telling you what he's doing. Some of you will open your heart. You will conduct a surgery and put something inside. You will cry, but beyond your cry, there is something that will not end when the meeting ends. Because his spirit will enter into you and you will see through his spirit and you will see something in God and that which you see in God becomes your own possession. Are you still with me? I worship you. I worship you. I wait. Wait for your fire. Can you sing with me? <laughs> I worship you. I worship you. I wait. I wait for your fire. I worship you. I worship you. I wait. I wait for your fire. I, I can't hear you. I worship you. I worship you. I wait. I wait for your fire. Hosanna, na, na, na. Hosanna. I wait. I wait for your fire. Now, the reason why most of us cannot worship God is because we don't know Jesus. If you, if you see Jesus, from the depth of your spirit, worship will rise. If you have ever encountered Jesus, and Jesus just comes and stays, walks around your room for 12 minutes. And doesn't speak a word. Out of the well of your spirit. His offering will come out of you. The offering of your lips. Will come from within your spirit. Spiritual sacrifices. You begin to offer. Hey na 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 because every other thing is a shadow. Time is an illusion. Human life is a shadow, it's deception. And that's why the Bible says the things that are seen are, 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 are temporal. Let your life not be based upon those things that are seen, they will vanish. But the things that are not seen, they don't appear obvious to, the, to your natural senses. It's only with your spiritual senses that you can decode their reality. Those things. I tell you. Come with me. Hebrews 11 verse 1. Now I want us to understand this personality called the Son of God very, very well. As we advance. Hebrews 1. Ooh. 
God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time pass unto the fathers by the prophets as in this last days spoken unto us by his son. Now from that point the Bible begins to tell us who his son is. Number one, please read aloud. Whom? Oh my God. Wait, wait. Now is there anybody sick in the, in the hall? Anyone sick among us? <laughs> read to my hearing please. The next um, part of the progression. Whom is, he has what? Now, this is it. First of all, the Bible reveals that the Son of God is, has been appointed as head in the heavens of all things. It means that everything that God has is as at his disposal. Alright? Just in case you approach the Father and say, I need grace. He says, sorry. I've willed my grace to my Son. It is only through my Son you can have access to grace. Just in case you approach the Father. And you say, I need strength to sustain my prayer life. The Father says, excuse me. Have you never read in your scripture? When Jesus said that I am the resurrection, I am the life. By the resurrection, he was talking about the quickening spirit. God is aware of the fact that your humanity is insufficient. And so if you are going to do the demands of God, God will have to upgrade you by his own mechanism, his own system. Even prayer, you cannot pray except you are quickened. And the Bible says that if the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwelleth in you, he shall quicken your mortal bodies to be able to do the will of God. So, if your problem is that you need to be helped by God to sustain a quality prayer life, there is a level of quickening that will make that a possibility. And he is the quickener. Because he said he is what? The resurrection. Everything that is paralyzed with respect to the will of God can be quickened to be able to carry out the will of God, not by his strength, but by his quickening. So if you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you leave him and you go to the Father and say, quicken me so that I'll know how to praise him, sorry. I will that to my son. The Bible says, he has made him what? Hair over all things. That means all of God's hopes, purposes, plans are bound on him. He is the administrator of all of God's divine purposes. Because all things have been willed to his trust. Number two, read. About the son of God. Oh, this class is boring. I think we need some prayer now. We need ventilation. We need to be helped by the Holy Ghost right now. Please read again. Now the Bible says that it was by his hand. By the hand of the son of God. That the worlds were made. Just trying to give us an understanding of the fact that. The son of God existed before eternity began. Are you getting? So he's the ancient of days. Time cannot define him. You can't know him in time. You must know him in his frame of reference. You must know him in eternity. And the only possibility of going beyond time into understanding the being of eternity must be by revelation. Number three, about the Son of God, who is he? Watch it. That third definition, the Bible says he is the brightness of God's glory. And the express image of God's person is indicative of the fact that it was the day he arrived the scene that God was defined. God was never defined until Jesus showed up. The best definition of God ever revealed in the Bible, Jesus Christ. The Bible says he was the brightness of, loss of God's glory. Indicative of the fact that he expressed God's glory and he represented God's personality. Are you, are, you, are you still here? So the Son of God 
as revealed in that scripture is the expression of God and the definition of God. And I always say that the clearest definition of God in the entire scripture is Jesus Christ. God was not obscured in the day that he walked this world. All of the attributes of God were manifested and put on display. They were revealed through his human virtues. His words were the words of God. His feelings were the feelings of the word of God. His thoughts were the thoughts of God. Everything about him was God on display. Just in case you came to him and said, who seen that this man was, was born blind? Anything he says is the viewpoint of God. In the day that he walked this world, God had an opinion, God had a perspective. Because when they came and said, the law said this, what do you say? They are saying, give us your own perspective. We need your own range. Give us your own opinion about the issue on ground. And his own opinion about the man that was born blind was that nobody sinned. He said, hey, all right, I think we said that people suffer because of the sins of their fathers. Who sinned? Is it him or his father? That he was born blind. Meanwhile, if the Bible, if, <laughs> if it's him that sinned, where, where did he sin? Did he sin before he was born? They felt they had roped Jesus into a corner. They didn't know that they were talking to the ancient of days. The one that fashioned every man in the studio before he released them into their mother's womb. He said, nobody sin. It's just that in the studio, when I gave people eyes, I gave Tony eyes, I gave Evangelist Paul eyes, I gave Sister Eunice Budu eyes, I decided not to give this one eyes. And he was born without it. And the reason why I decided not to give him eyes in eternity was so that I can come and give him eyes in time. He said, this thing is deliberate just to manifest the glory of God. Please help me tell your neighbor, maybe you are lacking something now. Maybe <laughs> it's not a sin. <laughs> it's not a sin. <laughs> but that the glory of God might be made manifest. I came into in time to give him his eyes. Why? Every time he manifested, he showed the perspective of God. And God was solidly on display. And the experience of the people that lived in the days of the incarnation was a great experience because God walked among them. They saw him speak. They understood his opinion. They knew that any time he felt something, it was the feeling of God. Mind you, it was not the word of God that entered into mud and became a man. It was the word of God that was what? Made flesh. You don't, you don't understand that. God created you. And they made something from the dust and put you inside. That's different. If a man dies, his spirit goes to God, his body goes into the dust from whence he came, and his soul goes into him. where? You don't study your Bible. When a man dies, what happens is that his 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 his, his universe is. Is, is universe is fragmented into its unit parts and each part goes to a different place spirit goes where to god why because the spirit came from where flesh goes where because it came from where now what is the law of genesis when god wanted to create oh i'm digressing from my sermon when god wanted to create first of all he created the raw material with which he wanted to use to create stuff. That's the first thing he did. Created sun, created the ocean, created the seas, created the firmament. Then, when he wanted to create animals, he spoke to earth. Bring forth creatures. And earth brought forth creatures. He wanted to create fish, he spoke to the water. Bring forth living creatures. Brought it. Wanted to create the sky, uh, the star, and the sun. Spoke to the firmament. Bring forth stars, the moon, 
I hope you know that scientists have been able to articulate that the sun is not a solid mass. It's a compendium of gases. If the star is going to stay alive, it has to stay in the firmament. That's where its source is. If the animal will stay alive, it must stay and be eaten from the ground. That's where its source is. If the, water, the fish wants to stay alive, it must well, stay in the water and eat from there. The fish dies, it turns back into what it was made from. The animal dies, turns back to. If, if a star leaves the firmament, it dies, becomes a meteorite. Do you get it? So it happens to be that we came out of God. And so when a man dies, his spirit goes back to. His body goes. And his soul goes to paradise. Until the judgment is accomplished. Hell is a temporary place. It's not a permanent place. Hell is for people that are not right with the laws of God. It's a temporary place of affliction. It's a price they are paying before the judgment. Paradise is the equivalent of hell to the people that were right with God. Are, are you with me here? And until Jesus comes, nobody gets to heaven. Because the Bible says that when the last trump shall sound, the dead in Christ will rise first. It means they are somewhere else than heaven. And they'll be rising means they are beneath. And the Bible says hell is beneath. The word hell there that is beneath is Hades. Hades is the place of the Father Spirit having two columns, hell and paradise. And if you check the revelations of Paul when he saw the universe, he saw the third heavens, he saw paradise. You get it? Oh, are you still with me? Ah, oh, have you been studying your Bible? Hey. <laughs> Let me stop there. Let me stop. It seems I'm talking. <laughs> Are we still? Is it? Are we okay? Hey, the Lord help us in the name of Jesus. Yeah. All right, let's do Jesus as the example. In Jesus' case, his spirit into thy hands I commit my spirit. Spirit goes to. Ah. Hey. Spirit goes where? Into thy hands I commit my. The Bible says. God did not allow his body to see what? Corruption. Why? He was not made of the earth. He was made of the word of God. If Jesus did not rise, he would have been there bodily, down in the grave now. Where was his soul? He said, thou will not allow my soul to remain in Hades. That's why he told that man, today you will be with me. Where? Okay, let me stop there. The, not heaven. And so what goes to hell or what goes to paradise is your soul. If you hear the, the testimony of that man that bunk a race to death, he was in paradise for three days. But he thought he was there for 30 minutes. And he was taken to hell too. Why people that make it to paradise, normally they take them to hell because it's the same plane. Different chambers of the same plane. It's a waiting place. You are not conscious of where you are coming from. You are only conscious of the, where you are. Why? Because you are dysfunctional. So in the Catholic church where they say, St. John, pray for me. The guy can't pray. You are not here. You are not. That. Okay, let me leave you. Let me leave you. Let me leave you. He doesn't have the capacity to pray. He's, he's dysfunctional. <laughs> well, how did I get here? Jesus. Now somebody help me find my way back. I need to get back. Please help me. Say St. Francis. He needs help. He's only a soul that is there. He has a mind. He's conscious of the environment. He can decide, all right, I want to go to Palace 7. Because you don't function by faith there. You function by thought there. I can show you from the Bible, but that's not what we are teaching. You don't need to function by faith because you are in the realm of your reality. That is your realm. Jesus. In the book of Revelation, you never find the word Holy Spirit. Have you ever asked yourself? Ah, 
Because the entire heavenly system runs under the system of the spirit. It's the spirit of God that regulates everything. So you find saints gathered together in one place. And if they want to bow down, they'll bow down at the same time. Not because there was choir master. It's as they feel the impression, their response. So that's, that realm is governed by the spirit. Now in this realm, we only have a down payment of the spirit. That's the measure of the spirit that you can have and still be in this flesh. If the measure increases beyond your measure, you'll be raptured. With that measure you have, God wants you to know the way of the divine life and begin to operate by that reading while on earth and grow to maturity because in eternity you'll still be growing forever. The knowledge of Christ will be increasing and you, if you are a prophet here, you'll be a prophet for eternity. I'm still off. I'm still off. So your calling is your reality. It doesn't change for eternity. But your poverty, which is the basis of your current prayers, you gather resources from heaven, and what you want to attack is your problem. Problem. It's attacking because, see, the principalities have blinded him from his reality. So his labor... He's from under a veil, doesn't strike a chord in eternity, doesn't advance his course in the context of his reality. Principalities have made him so. St. John can't pray. He's dysfunctional totally. <laughs> I hope you know <laughs> if you are going to pray successfully, prayer is an exercise of your spirit. Your soul only feels the pressure coming from your spirit so that you can have you cannot you will be you won't be a robot as your spirit is coming with that kind of groaning your soul feels the tempo the temper takes some of that vibration of that exo esoteric release and it makes you respond in your outlook in the light of your reception so that it's as if that which you release influences your entire being but it comes to pass a time comes when you are separated that faculty that is still conscious is your soul and then they'll take you for a song course round heaven round paradise and say you hear that song say, yes i'm hearing it but there's nobody there say it's the flowers that are singing say ah flowers have you not heard in the book of Revelation that everything on heaven, in heaven and on earth will sing, the plants, the trees, the river. That's it. It's telling you about this realm. And the time will come when the will of God is done on earth as it is done in heaven, even on earth. You will hear the flowers sing. But what you are experiencing now is a glimpse. You are tasting of the powers of the age to come. Because in the age that comes, you will experience the fullness of that reality. You are in covenant with a God that is alive, not just alive, a God that is living. And that's why every time you have an encounter with God, the revelation of God, life is released into your spirit. The next time you celebrate your birthday, when you ask the people to pray for you, don't pray for more days. Ask for more life. <laughs> Ask for what? More life. More life. You need another measure of life beyond the one you are you have now. Because the Bible says, it, it, the Bible speaks about the supply of the Spirit of God. That's the agent that comes to give life. You can expand life. That's why the Bible says virtue left him. The divine life can be expanded. It needs to be replenished, renewed. You need more life, not more years. If you understand the life and you have that life in sufficiency, all right, in 27 years, you can do what people that live for 120 cannot do. That man has more life 
not necessarily more years somebody was praying the other day that the congregation to pray that they will live for 70 years 70 dead dry years of less life that's a cause because the time will come when you will pray to die if your life is not connected to some divine purpose striking a chord in, your, in the realm of your reality you will lose fulfillment and years length of years will be a cause in your hand there are some kind of prayers that you'll never be able to pray because you don't know enough of the realm of your reality and that's why jesus comes he's the gateway into your realm the more you know him the more you know yourself i know you don't believe that because the bible says we have his workmanship recreated in christ jesus so you were created and now you have been recreated in christ jesus to become another vessel this vessel and this creature that you are in christ you don't know that creature except you know christ you don't know that creature because the only possibility of understanding that creature is the extent to which you have come into the brightness of his glory when jesus christ shows up then the unveiling takes place and you begin to have revelations of the realm of god it's in that plane that you can understand who you are that's how the book of revelation was written how did he start jesus just showed up and when he showed up there was an unveiling the spirit realm was open and john began to have access to the realm why because he was the brightness of what the glory of god just in case you suffer loss in the way of revelation it's because he has not yet showed up if he shows up what happens an unveiling apocalypsis the veil is taken the curtain is removed and the spirit realm becomes accessible it's in those times that you get to find out your reality who you really are if not you will live in the shadow of yourself forever if your eyes are not enlightened i wanted to be a lecturer that was my dream and i fought hard to be that i saw one lecturer coming to the hall and when he showed up he preached he, he delivered a sermon for two hours without consulting textbook label diagrams gave notebooks notes off head his name was dr banke when i saw him i said this is my destiny <laughs> oh la 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 i said this is my destiny i want to come into the chemistry class and draw structures label all kinds of organic structures without a notebook he understand what i'm talking about <laughs> he they are our these descendants <laughs> hallelujah that was my dream i wanted to come there because i had a special ability to lift stuff i can cram crazy i said that's where i'm going and the way i made up my mind to go there i would have reached there if not that there was a strong hand that said that is not given to you to be a lecturer because god knew that there was one thing that could resist me from answering the call if i become a lecturer because of my i love knowledge and he, he knows that if he put me puts me in a place where knowledge says ah i'll be preoccupied for my lifetime that will be an, a hindrance to his agenda because the knowledge he called me to dispense was not the knowledge of chemistry was a knowledge of a mystery but i did not know i was drawn because i saw how versatile that lecturer was the guy drew diagrams labeled them gave notes and from 100 level to 400 level he didn't come to the class with a notebook rock banking they said that was how he was in his undergraduate that they had to manipulate him out of first class he was a shining light so i caught that inspiration and i wanted to walk into that shadow and it was not given to me the lord then in the revelations of god when the vista was open because he appeared and the heavenly realm was accessible then i saw that one of my assignments in my reality was to teach the unsearchable riches of god ah i said why didn't you tell me quick i won't have suffered myself 
but it was not his fault that I did not know on time. He was available to reveal, but I did not feel that his revelation will add any value to my life. From that day, I discovered that it was the revelation of Jesus Christ that led to an entrance into the knowledge of my reality which will give me an understanding of my true definition in the context of God. And I found out how to channel the desire for knowledge. Hallelujah. And when he told me that my life and my destiny had to do with picking strange secrets from the depths of, of, of the heavens and breaking them into little, little capsules that can be delivered in, in small, small doses. Like as you are here now, we can go on for 10 hours, I assure you. We'll just be going. We'll just be going. Because where I come from in the realm of the spirit, we walk on knowledge, on revelation. That was the only thing that could quench, that could give fulfillment to my hunger and thirst for knowledge. You have some latent power at work in you now. You may never know how to utilize it until you have a revelation of Jesus Christ. He will take you to the chambers in the realm of the spirit where you can find that which will give fulfillment to that cry that comes from your inside. Every time there's a cry from your inside, it's because you are a being of dominion. You were made to dominate and it's a cry of dominion that is coming from inside. But until you meet with the revelation of Christ, you will not know in what area your dominion will find expression. It's true you are ordained to dominate, but not everywhere, my friend. I tried to dominate as a lecturer, but it was not given to me. But we have a, a, a doctor at the back there. She attends every prayer meeting. If you give night vision, she'll be here. I visited her on campus. I saw that her course was mathematical. I didn't understand it. It was as if they were drawing numbers. But if you call for prayer, she'll come. How is she coping? Is, is, there is grace to make it happen. If you are in a place you don't have grace for, where God won't allow you to go there. <laughs> the Lord give you understanding in the name of Jesus. When you see Christianity, the temper, the tenacity, the fire of the Christian faith dying down is because we have been working on duplicates. The original is becoming extinct. Except there is the revelation of Christ, the confession, the historic confession of Paul or Peter that was the foundation of his spiritual building will be lacking because in that confession we see the extent of the spiritual beauty Jesus wants to construct. Anywhere revelatory con con confession about the revealed Christ is, there the church is. And there alone the church is. He will come to you during this conference. He will enlarge you. It will cause your eyes to see your reality. 